Welcome to this podcast where director Jeff T. Thomas chats with some of the most talented TV and film directors in the industry. This is an in-depth look at how they got into the business, as well as sharing some of the most defining moments in their career. This is The Director's Podcast. So in this episode of the Director's Podcast, I'm going to break down some of the things that I've learned from interviewing the other directors, and I'm going to pass on some of the knowledge that I've learned from directing 100 music videos and 70 commercials and over 60 television dramas, including pilots. I've shot a lot of these jobs in many, many different countries, from Cuba to Australia to South America to Eastern Europe. And I'm just going to give you some of the information that I've learned along the way, as well as talk you through the process that I go through when I first receive a script and how I take that script from script to screen. So first up, I've always said that you need two out of these three things to work in the film industry. And those three things would be talent, perseverance and luck. Now, I see a lot of people that are talented and they persevere and they motivate the work and they go out and they go and get it. I see people that are talented and they don't really push, but they might get lucky and they get busy that way. And I also see people that aren't talented at all, but they push and they persevere and then they get lucky and they also, you know, go out and you make some of the movies that you might not like in the world. Now, if you have all three, then you're more likely to be one of the great directors that we all love. Because as so many of you know, being in the right place at the right time is a very important part of any business, let alone filmmaking. Now, when I was growing up in Wales, I knew musicians who were some of the most incredible guitarists I'd seen, but they didn't know how to market themselves. They didn't know how to go to London and go to the record companies and and get people to listen to their tapes, to listen to their music. The internet wasn't around at that time. So unfortunately, I saw so many talented people just fizzle away and, you know, go and do something else for a living and let their talents fall by the wayside. Now, when I wanted to break into the industry, I was the kid that felt like I had some talent and I wasn't going to make the same mistakes as some of those other people that I'd seen. So I would pick up the phone, I would spend all of the money that I had calling record companies to try to get them to watch a music video I might have shot just with friends. I would write treatments, which is what you write for music videos. It's your expression, your idea of the music for bands I didn't even know, for bands that I didn't even know were making those music videos, but I would write them. I would take them to London. I would show them to the record companies until such time people actually started reading them and liking them. And R.E.M. ended up reading one and Propaganda Films, which represented Michael Bay and David Fincher and Spike Jones signed me only for a short period of time and I got a break doing music videos at age 21. Now I'm not going to talk too much about how I got into the industry and go into details of that because I think we've learned enough from the other directors but let's break down what I really think that you need to do if you are going to try to get some sort of momentum with your work. I love what Slick was saying in his episode, how you can't have a defeatist mentality. I love Scott Mann and how he just took knockback after knockback and he kept getting up after, you know, going through everything that he went through. I love how Nicole Cassell, after getting a knockback from the writer of the play that she wanted to make into a movie, said no, she went off and wrote the script on spec. You have to make your own luck. And you've got to be able to get up and you've got to be able to get going again once you do get that knockback because it's going to happen no matter how long you're directing. I don't care if you're Squisacy or somebody that's just starting off when they're 21. It happens to everybody. Now, one observation that a listener made while listening to the podcast was that all of our guests had started young. Now, this plays into my luck element because I think everybody who was on this podcast... Uh, all of our guests were are very talented and they have perseverance, but because they started young, they also had enough time to get that little bit of luck. David Slade talks about this in his episode, 
how he believes that luck comes around for him like every five years or so. For me, I have moments in my life which are defined by having those lucky moments, but I was prepared and I was ready to make the best of that situation when it came to me. Now that doesn't mean that if you're trying to get into directing and you're a little bit further on in your life, that doesn't mean that that's not going to happen here. You know, if you read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers book, he talks about the 10,000 hours and I think there is something to that, but there is also something called borrow time where if you're a writer, if you're an actor, if you're somebody, if you're an editor, somebody working in the industry that's around a director, that's around making those creative decisions all the time, I think you can pass some of that information, some of that knowledge that you've learned from being on set, running a set, being as a producer, as a writer, uh, being an actor, and use that to inform how you direct. Now, we've seen plenty of actors go off and be great directors. Same thing with writers, same thing with editors. And this goes on with assistant directors. And you look at James Cameron being a production designer for Roger Corman, but get in early so that you can get lucky and be ready. Hard work is the one consistent thing that everybody has. I left a note for one of my assistants after a job and the note was work harder than all your contemporaries because that's what's worked for me. If I go for uh, directing an episode of television and it might be you know, an episode in season two, I will watch or read every episode running up to that point because I don't want to be on set where the lead actor or somebody that's number three in the call sheet goes, yeah, but Jeff, I can't do that because I used to be married to that person or dating that person. I have to know everything that I can know leading up to that point. And that's a lot of work. Sometimes it's more work than actually shooting the show itself, but I don't feel like you're giving it your all, I certainly don't feel like I'm giving it my all unless I do all that research, unless I do all that homework and anything I need to know uh, beforehand. Scott Mann in episode 12 talks about just making shit. He means you've just got to go out there, you've just got to make it, you've got to make those short films, you've got to make those music videos, those TikTok shorts, the Instagram reels, wherever it may be, you're going to learn how to be a filmmaker from going out there and doing it. There is a book called Myths of Creativity, and in that book it says how neuroscientists have discovered that brains of exceptionally creative people can better connect the ideas stored in grey matter, which is the brain tissue that stores what you think. White matter is the connecting tissue responsible for transporting those electrical pulses. Thus, exceptionally creative people have found to have more white matter than others, allowing them to blend ideas in a more creative way. Now, this has nothing to do with your genes. White matter grows the more you use it. So go out, be creative. Look on YouTube, there's a guy, Zach King, I love what he's doing today on social media. He reminds me of what Michel Gondry was doing in music videos in the 90s. It's an exciting time to be inspired, to be motivated and be creative. You have Photoshop, you have, everything's on your laptop today. It didn't used to be like that. So I think we're gonna see a lot of amazing talent emerge and make some fantastic movies, television shows, music videos, commercials, whatever they may be. Okay, so a little disclaimer here, I'm imagining that the script is already at a place that uh, I want it to be at, that the producer wants it to be at, that everybody, the writer, everybody is happy with. Jumping in, now my job has two different tiers. I often work as a guest director on television shows and I'm sometimes uh, the producing director and the person responsible for creating the look and the tone together with the showrunner and the studio and everybody else involved. So I'll talk a little bit about our flip-flop between the two of them, I think both are relevant. Now like David Slade, like Paris Barkley, when I first receive a script, if it, even if, no matter what it's for, if it's for a pilot, if it's for an episode of television, I will turn off everything. I'll have what David called the dreaming stage. I love to do that where I don't think about anything else. I'll have my cup of tea or a coffee if it's early in the morning. I'll have my water and I won't have any snacks and I'll just focus and I'll try to visualize the story as I read it. So I'll paint this picture in my head of the sets, of the characters, of the environment, of the tone, and it's all coming off the page. It's all coming off the, everything that's written there. 
but I also don't try to force it. If something doesn't come to me at that time, it doesn't matter. I don't worry too much about it. I let that evolve as I as I think about the script afterwards. I may go for a walk. I may um, I think walking is a great way to think. It oxygenates your brain. It gives you exercise and it, it takes you away from everybody and you get to really think through the material that you've just read. I try to break down the script. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to interpret the script. Is it subjective? Is it objective? Is it a film? Is it a movie? Is it a mystery? Is it suspense? I'm trying to define the difference. What is it about? Not the plot, but what are the other underlining themes? How can we reflect that visually? What is the story really about? What is the subtext? What's the voice? What's the tone? How can you best interpret that? Defining the conflict in a scene. And again, how can you reflect that as a director? Does the camera have a specific move that is going to be tied to one set of emotion? Are you going to light it differently? Are you going to be more oppressive and light from above at the earlier part and be more painterly and composed at the latter half of the story? Um, is it the opposite? Um, you know, there's so, just so many different ways. What's the music going to do? What's the wardrobe going to do? I did a show a while ago for a spy drama and I remember having this conversation with the actor when we were talking, one of the lead actors, when we were talking about what he was going to be wearing and we talked about the entire season and how he was going to start off with this bag and his, these, he was wearing these uh, glasses which were going to get thicker framed and they were going to get th much thicker as we travelled through this 10 year period of his time and how his bag was going to start weighing him down as the weight of what he was doing was taking its toll on him. So all of that comes into play, even the way you frame a shot, you know? Is it tense? Is it fluid? Um, do we follow one individual as they move? Do, how does the lighting reflect that tone? I pitched on a show and I said, look, the obvious way to shoot this scene when this character's sitting in this in situation where she's kind of being interrogated would be to you know the beautiful way would be to have all the desk lamps and to light with practicals maybe we have some sort of key light coming into the window but that doesn't really reflect how the character is feeling at this time so rather than do that if you've got a character that's feeling awkward in a situation Maybe we light her from above. Maybe we use fluorescent light so you get more of that Fight Club type of look, you know, that kind of greeny blue look. So it's defining the different skin tone on the character. It's, it's creating heavy lighting. There's a feeling of discomfort about, um, about that. Also, how do you frame it? Do you frame it with a, the wider lens so you're in tight? If you're doing that, you're more in the head of the actor rather than if you're over the shoulder on a longer lens, you're more in the world of the person interrogating that person. So everything you do comes into play. When I did this show, I did a pilot for the show called The Oath with Sean Bean and Ryan Quantin and the DP, Tim Burton and I would discuss together with the production designer, Gabor and the wardrobe and everything, how we were going to have the season expand. So I was directing six out of the 10 episodes. I was cross-boarding six at once, including the pilot. Um, so it'd be the first four and the last two, and then a uh, fantastic director came in and did the middle four. And basically we created the style. So, you know, we were gonna start more long lens and as the show got more and more intense and more personal, the lenses would get wider and get closer to our actors. Now, I remember having the conversation with Wardrobe and how we were gonna have all of the cop gangs that uh, one of uh, this FBI guy was trying to infiltrate be in very similar tones in what they were wearing. So they were kind of muted blues, greens, you know, that kind of stuff. And how this FBI guy was trying to assimilate himself into that group. Now, for the first couple of episodes, he's wearing a muted red. Now, nobody else wears red in the entire show except for him. And gradually, as the season progresses, we started playing the red down. Maybe it would only be in one scene and it wouldn't be in another. And then gradually, he his wardrobe just shifted into the tones of the cop gang as he got assimilated into that cop gang and as he started thinking like that cop gang. Now that show in particular was a very point of view based show uh, and that was all came out of the script. I remember reading it 
and having a meeting with Sony and Joe Halpern asked me, how are you going to shoot this bank robbery? And my takeaway was, well, we don't know, this is at the beginning of the, the very first episode, we don't know that these bank robbers are our heroes at the very start. So maybe we start with uh, bank tellers, you know, somebody, one of the customers at the bank. And then gradually as the scene evolves and we start following the bank robbers out of the bank and into the back and out onto the street, we realize that they're our lead characters and our perspective starts shifting and going towards them. Then what happens is they jump into the back of this cop car, they take off their overalls and their police officers and they go and secure the scene. So that scene in itself really much, really dictated how the whole season was approached. So I pitched that we should always tell the story from the protagonist's point of view. So rather than being uh, an objective point of view, which a, a lot of shows or movies are, I wanted to make it a very single perspective point of view. So say when Sean walks into a room, you don't cut to the people into the, inside the room uh, until Sean sees them. You're outside with Sean. You're following him. You're either in front of him, behind him, profile, whatever. And then when he walks into the room, you see those people inside that room for the first time. If it was objective, you would start inside the room with those individuals. Or maybe if it's a different type of show, it wouldn't have worked on that show. If you're trying to lean on something like a little bit of awkwardness with somebody that's going to play off as subtext later, you might want to start with them before revealing uh, our lead character. You know, again, perspective plays where, you know, is a mystery or suspense. You know, if it's mystery, you're discovering things as our lead character discovers them or as our characters are discovering them. If it's a suspense, we might realize that uh, we might know a little bit more than our character. Hitchcock used to talk about this and how he would see the bomb under the table during a conversation and the lead character wouldn't know that there was a bomb there. That's more suspenseful than mystery. If it was mystery, you would be with that character and you would discover the bomb at a different place. Now, how you cover that scene is completely reflected by what the tone of the, the movie, the TV show, whatever it is that you're doing as is the composition, as is the wardrobe, as is the production design, as is the music. Imagine that lead character bending down and she looks underneath the table and discovers the bomb for the very first time. That's going to have a lot more of a dramatic resonance with the audience than if they knew the bomb was there the whole time. But what is great about this is if you go back and you look at the 10 minute scene that played up to that point if the audience is slightly ahead of that character at that point then they're biting the nails they're on the edge of their seat they're thinking this bomb could go off at any time and, and you're saying bomb it could be anything it could be a gun under the table it could be nothing at all it could be a telephone waiting to call somebody or recording somebody the scene plays out differently so you know all of these things should be thought about when you're when you approach a project and Again, this could be something you shoot on your cell phone. It doesn't matter. You've got to practice and practice and shoot until you get to where you want to be. And then you learn more. You start a podcast and interview other directors. You learn how they did it and you think, oh, well, that's actually really great. I've never thought about that. Or you read some of the books that some of the great directors have done or you've gone on to the masterclass.com uh, and you watch what James Cameron or any, you know, any of the directors, any of the writers, any of the storytellers and also any of the other fantastic people that they have on that app. David Slade talks about how he doesn't look at other movies or television shows to find his inspiration. Um, I think starting off in music videos, we talk a little bit about this in episode one, we were very fortunate uh, and also both of us doing commercials at the time that we were forced to find new ways of expressing how an image takes place, what happens, because, you know, we were telling stories through imagery. So we would always be out at the Tashin store. We would always be at the Tate Modern. We would always be at the theater um, trying draw, drawing information and inspiration from anywhere we possibly could. I remember I did this episode of Stalker and Eon Bailey was uh, one of the actors I was working with and he was playing a stalker, Maggie Q stalker, and he said to me, he said, what's the thought process about me giving her these white flowers? And I said, well, last week when we were discussing the props, 
I remember years ago talking about psychometric testing with friends and we would try these tests on each other and it would uh, give you um, an insight of what that person's actually feeling or how they are in their life at that point without being very direct. One of the psychometric questions was, if you give somebody flowers, what color are they? And one of the answers was, if you give somebody white flowers, it shows that you're actually wanting something from them, where if you give somebody red flowers, it shows that you're actually giving something to them and you want less in return. So as he was a stalker, I said, I had that conversation with the props department and with the showrunner and we decided to give you white flowers. He loved it. Now, if you ever want to get an actor to trust you, then show them that you've put this much thought process into something. Show them that you've actually thought about it and you're not just going through the same motions that you do with every job. You've got to treat every job like it's the best possible job because that showrunner, that show, that pilot, whatever it may be, it's hiring 150 people and all of those people want that job to succeed and you're at the helm and it's your responsibility to make it the best possible project that it can be. Now, after I did that show, The Oath, I did a show with Kevin Williamson and Kevin was very involved and I was putting together that lookbook for the pilot. And that was a lookbook that was gonna work for the entire season. We had three storylines that were running. He very much wanted each one to have their own identity. So I started putting together um, a color palette for each one. The color tones are very much inspired by the tones and themes of every scene, how they play out, uh, what the characters are actually like. Um, and then, you know, I'd go away and I put this lookbook together and I, I graded it with Lightbox. I put it together with Photoshop. I mixed things. I, you know, separated images and I created a look for the show that was pretty much um, exactly how the show ended up looking. But that's just the photography and the production design part, right? Then we have to look at the wardrobe and what would somebody in this situation be wearing and, you know, to try to build the character from the ground up. Paul Wesley was playing a writer who would kidnap uh, people and, and use them as his muse. And so we decided that uh, because this wasn't the first time he had, uh, you know, this was like the third person that he was actually kidnapping, that he was very good at this. So he was very immaculate in the way that he dressed. He was very focused, you know, and obviously this built, he got more and more immaculate as he actually captured this person. And as he started writing again and had this muse, so the camera actions also reflected that. So the cameras were always focused on Paul. They would always move with Paul. So if Paul sat down, the camera would move exactly with him and he sat down. And sometimes it would take 15 takes to get it, but it had to be precise. Where one of the other storylines would be was following this character, Jackson, who was an alcoholic musician. He was trying to get his life back in, you know, in together. And for that, we did that all handheld. So each story not only had its own color palette, it. it had its own way that we were shooting it. Sometimes I would shoot in Jackson's world. I would shoot the rehearsals. We'd get all those moments that were never planned, but would be inspired in um, Tucker's world, which is Paul Wesley's world. They were much more composed. And then in Ashley's world, which was um, much more aspirational. We made sure they reflected that with wider lenses and cranes and that kind of stuff. So again, all of this comes into play. Now, once I've read the script, I'm trying to paint this picture in my head as I'm reading it. So I might go back and I might read it again, or I'll have post-it notes and I scribble down the post-it notes and I'll stick it on the page. I do that because often drafts will change and I'll be taking out a page and I'll have to transfer all of my notes from one page to the next page. I found if I do it on post-it notes, I can just take the post-it note off and put it back on something that just saves an hour every week. And sometimes when you're doing a, a schedule like I did on the Oath, I had five weeks prep to shoot six episodes. I had to also learn inside and out the other four episodes because I was shooting the episodes either side. We had over a hundred characters and probably five different cop gangs. Everybody would mix together. I, I actually got my assistant to put like an FBI board together where we saw the top of each gang and we had string running from one person to the next. And then as we cast those actors, I would take their headshots and I would stick it on that board. So very early on, I would learn exactly who worked for who, who is, who's having a relationship with who, how they know each other. And so I'd have a visual representation of what was taking place in the script. 
Now, then you have to have all the meetings with the production designer, with the wardrobe, with the photographer. You've got to figure out what cameras you're going to shoot it on. So we would test three different cameras on Tell Me A Story. We would test lenses. We'd have uncoated Russian lenses, and that gives you a certain type of look. Maybe we're going to use one type of lens. Actually, we have three different types of lenses for the three different storylines um, when we first started out. Bradford Young, who's a fantastic cinematographer, has a great interview online, which I'll, I'll put in the show notes so you can check that out. And he talks a lot about the difference between wide lenses and long lenses and the emotion that they create. It's the same with the texture of the, the image that you're looking at, if it's got an uncoated image, if it's um, so, sometimes things can look too glossy, they can look too clean, they can look too fresh. What type of lens flares do you have? Are you using spherical? Are you using anamorphics? Are you using C-series anamorphics with Panavision? Like the ones that really Scott was shooting in the 70s when he would do Aliens or Blade Runner. You know, everything plays into, uh, you know, that. Also, those old lenses, they look fantastic, but they take forever because they are, they're old and they've been knocked around and they fall out of focus and they don't go on too well. So if you're doing one story like Jackson's story and telling your story, which is all handheld, and sometimes we're shooting the rehearsal and, you know, where there is no real rehearsal and it's a lot more, you know, visceral, then you don't want to use those lenses because there's a chance that they're going to be out of focus. But with Tucker, Paul Wesley's story, you can. So everything plays. Again, you know, do are you going to have a lot of night shoots? If you're going to have a lot of night shoots, maybe you think about building uh, some of the sets because you don't want to exhaust your crew. Uh, I've learned that you're much better off doing having your crew work in 100% for 12 hours than 80% for 14 hours. Um, you get the same amount of work and at the end of the week, your crew will respect you, your crew will like you, your crew will work better for you. If you work within that 12 hours, sometimes even less if you're very prepared. Uh, also with the actors, I try to create a real family vibe. You know, the thing that I always say to them is like, you know, there's no them and us on this show or whatever this project may be. We're all together. We're here. If somebody messes up their lines, it doesn't matter. The other actor should help you. Um, same thing with the camera operator. If, some, if something happens with the focus pulling, don't get annoyed. We're all here together. Let's just work together and be there for one another and, and create a real family feeling. And this culminated when I did The Oath, where Ryan Cranton, on his day off, would actually come to set at 12.30 at night to be the other side of a telephone conversation off camera for one of our actors who is a guest actor who's only playing like maybe 10 days out of the whole season and Ryan would be there to help motivate the correct response from the other actor as Ryan gave him his dialogue in return. So that's the type of environment that I like to create and I, for me that's the best working environment. It makes me happy every day when I go to set, it makes the people happy. We like to have fun as well because for one hour of television we'll be working 30 days um, for that one hour or at least the director will because you've got to go through prep, you've got to go through the shoot and you've got to go through post-production. If it's a pilot it's going to be longer, if it's a movie it's longer again. Something else I learned um, from one of the great children as I was working with, uh, if you build a set on stage, it's actually good to build that set a little bit larger because what will happen is, uh, you know, you have pull away walls when you're shooting on stage. And what you find is as directors come in, they don't, they're running out of time and they don't want to pull away the wall because they're going to lose 20 minutes from that. So they'll end up doing the master shot from somewhere else. And then you end up with a season of uh, master shots all taking place from the same place. When I was doing the oath, I wanted every bit, everything to feel incredibly authentic. So even down to the bar, we had this one location that always played in every episode. And I said to Gabor, production designer, fantastic production designer and good friend, I said, I want the actors to walk into this bar and I want them to smell that smell of stale alcohol. Now, growing up in Wales, one of my best friend's parents used to own this bar and we used to play in it when we were kids. I remember this stale smell of alcohol that you just can't get out of, you know, a, a bar. So I got them to pour alcohol <laughs> all around the set and it really stank. And, you know, over a couple of days it would get a little less, but it really helped build the, the picture. 
I would also play music in the in the bar. So when the actors, as we were rehearsing and as we were setting up the shots, so when the actors uh, started saying their dialogue after I said action, we would cut the music because you can't have music running through a scene. It will never match as you cut from one shot to the next. But the actors will know what level they should be speaking at. Now, when I'm scouting locations, you always want to have the most cinematic locations you can find. Sometimes you'll find one incredible location and you'll need two others to pair with that location on that one day. You've got to figure out which, what's the page count? What, what, what's the audience going to remember? Because you might not get three of the perfect locations that you want because the other two have to be close by because you can't afford to pick up your whole crew and move them to another place because you're going to lose two hours of your day by doing that. So you got to look at the look at the light, look at the coverage, look at you know the action or the dialogue or whatever it may be and make those decisions based on that. Now when going out and shooting exterior, I always say take a Sunseeker app with you so you can actually tell where the light is going to be. Um, I don't do shot lists uh, like like uh, some of our other directors. I do a plan. So on the opposite sheet of the dialogue, I have the giant post-it note, which is probably almost the size of the page. And I will work out the proscenium. I'll work out where the cameras are going go to go. I don't have the lens choices because I allow, you know, I want people to contribute and I want to see the action play out. Um, and I'll make adjustments with the DP and the director of photography and the actors and everybody on the day. So, but I have, I have a plan and that plan will know which way I want to look. So when we go there in the tech scout, I can say to the production designer, okay, you're only going to need to cover this side of the street. We only need to change these cars. We only need to put, um, posters or you know to cover the street signs or whatever we might need to be on this side of the street because we're never going to see the other side and then that way you're saving dressing the entire street when you're there with your dp if it is sunny and sometimes you'll text scout and you'll turn up there on the day and it will actually be cloudy so you know that's another adjustment but if it is actually sunny you're getting your key light from the correct place so you are saving time and this is something that you can use and you can place elsewhere and use that to your advantage. So the first thing I like to do is direct from the inside out. You know, I like to look at uh, the, the character. I like to try to show on screen what they're feeling and any way I can do that, uh, I will do that. Something else you've got to take into account, I think, is um, I learned this when I just started doing television. I, I, my first two television episodes were the show called Without a Trace and CSI New York. Now, both were hit shows on network television. Without a Trace was very moody, very dark, very muted. And CSI New York was very colorful, very energetic and very pretty. Now, I remember going for a walk like I do on the weekend and thinking, I wonder why Without a Trace is able to do this dark kind of seven-ish, you know, kind of 90s Fincher look, or Im try to imitate that style where CSI doesn't, but they're, they're, they're both successes. And I, I kind of figured out that, well, in Without a Trace, this is a missing person show. They always find the missing person at the end. Where in CSI New York, it starts often starts with the death of a person. So I think you want to think about how to make your project palatable to an audience as well. If you're starting with a death and you have this dark show, it's going to be difficult to watch. I think it's more immersive if you're in a cinema. And I think you can get away with a lot more because people tend to leave uh, less frequently than they do switch over channels. But I think it's something to keep into account. Think about what's palatable for your, for your audience. And especially if you're doing something over an entire season, which can be 20 hours of television. It's more often 10 hours these days for a season, but either way, it's still a lot to experience. Now, if I'm shooting action, that is something that I will prep within an inch of its life. So the way I work with everything is I, I, I prep everything 
and then I try to stick to only 70% of what I planned and I like to leave the 30% to being inspired on the day. So it might be something that the actor does, it might be something that the writer changes, it might be something that the light does and suddenly it looks better if we look, move the crew and everything slightly over this way. So, you know, you can do that if, if your day is allowing it. But if you're doing action, that's often not the case. So for action, I will storyboard. I will prep it as much as I can. Uh, I did the opening sequence, of the opening two episodes for the season two of The Oath with 50 Cent and Sean Bean and Ryan Quentin and all, all these fantastic actors that we had in that show. And we had worked out, we had two 12 hour days to shoot this opening action sequence. So I had figured out with the AD, with the DP, with everybody, and we all got involved, like where the sun was going to be every 15 minutes of that day. And as we were shooting on this freeway, we had 50 cars with 50 runners and 50 walkie talkies and eight stuntmen and everybody had weapons and you know we had glass blowing out we had squibs we had smoke we had all of this kind of stuff so everything had to be prepped with as much detail as we could actually put into it. I would work for days trying to put this thing together. I had boards of where everybody was going to be running from what point to what point, at, you know, se several parts of the story. There is actually a making of this uh, scene on my website, jefftthomas.com, and it's the opening of The Oath, uh, season two. Anyway, so I basically do as much as I possibly can before I get to the shoot, but I also try to allow myself to be creative on the day, and I can do that by being 100% uh, prepped. And like I said, it's not always a shot list. It's more often a plan, and then if it's action or if it's something that needs to be planned within that much detail, like, like an action sequence, then I will do a storyboard. Now, if I've done that, the night before the shoot, I will sleep extremely well. I have no problem sleeping before a shoot. I get up and I'm excited and I'm ready to go that morning. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about blocking. So, every actor needs a different director, Paris Barkley says, and he's so right because what he means by that is you can direct some people one way, but you can't direct everybody the same way. So, um, you may have an actor that just likes to, you know, joke and mess around and just you might want to just tell them where they want to go and what you're planning on doing. Where you have other actors who may be a little bit more method and they may need a little bit more coaching and coaxing to find uh, a particular place that you want them to be and how you want them to do it. Or you're, if it's not an action sequence and it's something that's... Um, dialogue based then you you know you can just build the scene with the actors like Roger Donaldson would do you feel it out you let the scene evolve and then you talk to your crew about how you're going to cover it but if it's action you're normally you're trying to fit the pieces together a little bit more something that I learned early on I started directing television drama in my early 30s there was a little bit of a pushback being a younger director at the time and I, I remember working with one actor who I only ever worked with at one time who was renowned as being extremely difficult. He was actually okay with me but, but that's because I never asked him to do anything that I knew would push him the wrong way. Basically, when this actor came into a scene, I would never say what you can say to some people. I thought the scene would play out over here, we're thinking about doing something like this, but you know, make it your own. With this actor, he'd want to come in and play it his own way without any consideration for anything else. So in order to get through our day, what I would do is I would show up there an hour beforehand with my plan and I would start moving everything that I wanted around the room. So. You know, a, a scene is dead if two people are sitting down, right, often in television. So you want to get them to get up and you want to have them walk around the room. So what I would do is, if that actor was meant to jump on the telephone, I would put the telephone at the opposite side of the room. And I would clean other telephones out of the way so the actor didn't say, why don't I just go to this telephone? So you you know, you know, want a bit of dialogue, you want to get a bit of movement as they move to that one telephone where you know your DP can light and create a key light because it's over by the window. You know you're going to get depth because you're not shooting into the corner of the room, you're shooting into a window or outside or you're in the wall looking back into the bullpen or you know whatever location may be 
And then you place the other actors, the guest actors, in places that you might want to have them as well. So if that lead actor goes in, makes a telephone call there and then looks around and the other person that they're meant to finish the scene with is on the other side of the room, the more likely that lead actor is going to get up and walk over to that person or they're going to or he's going to call them or they're going to meet in the middle or they're going to be doing something. But if that person's sitting opposite them, the whole scene is going to play in that one place and it's going to be dead. So I'm always trying to guide the scene in a way that I think it will help tell the story the best. And because some actors are sensitive, they don't want to feel like you are pushing them into a place that is quote unquote cool. What I would tend to do is I would stand where I want the act, where I want the camera to be. So we would have prepped this scene by now. So we've already said that we we're having a key light coming from here, from here. So I would stand in the area watching the rehearsal while that actor comes in and what you find is they tend to open themselves up to you. So especially if you're there with the DP or your, your script supervisor, they will open up. Some of them have done theater previously, Some of, and this is often subconscious, but stand where you want your camera to be, that also helps. Now, I would hear stories of the past where Walter Murch, one of the greatest editors of recent years, would talk about Francis Ford Coppola on the set of The Godfather. And he said when Francis didn't want one of the actors to be as expressive with his hands, he would give him a drink and he would fill that drink all the way to the top so that actor had to hold that drink the entire scene so he couldn't move his hands around. Sometimes you use these little tricks because it just makes it easier. When you've got so many things to balance, when you've got 150 people there and you've only got an hour to get out of the scene and the sun's going down or whatever it may be, there are little tricks that you can do like that. Now, when I did the oath, because I did six episodes and we were block shooting, meaning I was shooting the pilot and the finale scenes, um, scenes from the pilot and finale on the same day, um, we would often jump ahead of time, one month, two months. So what, what I learned actually from Tom Sizemore when I was doing a job with him was I had little post-it notes and I would put these on my script and on the script I would have so Tom Tom would do this thing where he would have NI and that's new information when he discovered something when his character discovered something new on screen and he had have OI old information so he knew how he was going to respond to that moment so I would do something similar I would get a small post-it note highlighting the scene I'd put it on the top of my script so if I were doing scene 36 it would it would be episode three scenes 36 I would go to that page. I always carry my scripts around with me. I don't work from sides. I would go to that page and I would say, this character was last seen LS at this point, doing this or talking about this or the subtext of this with this other actor. So I would open up the script, I would be there, and I would just say, I know that you know this already, but I just wanna let you know, this was the last time we saw you, it was with so-and-so actor, or you just learned that your mother had died or, or something. So it was just a nice little refresher, especially if you're cross-boarding so many episodes, or if the actors are jumping from one episode to the next. I find that that helps make them feel like you know what you're doing, it helps them feel more relaxed, and it also might inform some of them who may not be 100% knowledgeable of where they are at that moment. So let's talk about takes a little bit. Everybody has their own different idea of how many takes. Roger Donaldson did a lot of takes. Paris Barkley would do less takes. Everybody does whatever takes that they think takes to make the take work. Me personally, what I do is, it can change depending on the scene. If it's a scene with two people in it and there's a little bit of background, it's probably not gonna be that high. If it's, if I got 100 people in the background, what I tend to do is I block the scene out with the actors and then when they go back to hair and makeup and you start setting up the shot and the background and the second AD starts moving people around, I will do background rehearsals. I will do camera rehearsals while I'm waiting for those actors to return because I want to iron out as much of the background, as much of the stuff that's going to be distracting before the actors get there. Now when the actors get there and we first shoot the first shot, I will very r rarely use that first shot. Because what I'm really looking at is like 
what isn't working. If somebody's, you know, carrying a red telephone behind them and there's an intimate conversation, that's going to be distracting. So I'm dissecting the scene. I'm looking at the top. I'm looking at the bottom. I'm figuring it all up, looking at the background, making sure the relationships between the people in the background are correct. So making sure that there's nothing jarring there. So when we get to take two, when we get to take three, my attention is focusing solely on the two actors that are in frame and I'm not being distracted by anything else. So background rehearsals before the actors get there can save you a whole deal of time and get better performances because every little bit of time that you save, you can put in and getting an extra take. I did a, a scene for a television show that I was a producer on, so I felt like I could do this. We were under schedule all week long. We got to Saturday or Friday night. It was about nine o'clock. We only had about an hour's filming left and everybody was in good spirits and the scene played out and as I was watching the scene played out it kind of played out somewhat differently than I imagined it and I turned to the DP and I said we could probably do this as one shot right and he was like yeah let's let's try so we did and we got the actors on board and we were moving thing one thing to the next and then the camera was panning and we were doing this amazing thing it took 20 takes to get it now did I use that take at the end? Did I use take 20? I did not use any single shots because when I got into the edit suite, I felt like the scene felt too aware that there was a director behind it. And it was the type of show that didn't really support that. It's much more of a visceral show rather than a cerebral show. So I ended up cutting it up and making sure it tied in with the rest of the show. But Everybody got behind it. We were all excited. The actors were excited and uh, it made to a great way to end the week. And then actually days later when that actor turns around and he said, uh, which take did you end up using? And I said, well, I actually cut it up because I didn't want the audience to feel like there was a director behind this. I think that showed him that I was there for them, for the story, for the project. It wasn't about ego. It wasn't about flexing my director muscles. I was doing what was best for the show at that time. Now, when I'm watching a take, I do actually do what Nicole Cassell does. I do actually make notes. Um, they're more mental notes. And generally I can, there's never really more than three notes on a scene every time I watch a scene. If there are then, I will stop the scene because there's obviously something not working correctly and I'll start over again. But I'll make notes and they will mental notes and then I'll go in and there might be a note on performance, it might be a note on blocking, it might be a note on uh, something in the room, you know, production design or, or the wardrobe or something uh, that we fix or photography or something. Now, if you listen to episode two of the director's podcast, David and I were talking about crossing the line and how sometimes you can be on one side of the line for one thing. And if you come back and you're repeating at the location and the actors haven't changed that much because they might be sitting down, there's no reason to do it. You can actually cross the line as, you know, to add variety to the scene, especially if you're doing it five or six times. Now you can also do it as an emotional point as well, as David was talking about. Uh, Michael Mann did this early on in his career. Um, Kubrick would do this, uh, you know, deliberately to jolt the audience back into the movie. I remember reading American Cinematographer in an interview with Darius Condry, whose photography I loved um, and still do. And he was talking about filming The Beach with um, Leonardo DiCaprio. And at one point he wanted the cinematography to help the lull that was happening in the script. And he did this from going from a very dark scene to going to a beach scene, but he overexposed the beach scene. So if you were sitting there in the audience and there was a bit of a lull in the story and you went from something that was slightly dark to suddenly you're, you know, you've got to adjust and it's overexposed. He used that little trick to kind of give it a little bit of a jolt. Um, other directors may do this with sound. I've heard of people mixing their sound very low at the beginning in order to get the audience to really focus on what they're saying. Like, did that actor just say that? And it's meant to help draw them in and then you get to better clarity of sound as the movie goes on, but they're already drawn in and they're already invested. No, I think uh, Tarantino actually does a, an incredible job at the beginning of Inglorious Bastards. If you want to see 
in my mind, one of the greatest ways to cover a 17-minute scene, I think it is. Uh, he does all of these tricks, not the overexposing of the sound, but he does the crossing the line, he creates the tension, He, it's uh, the production design is fantastic, the wardrobe, the casting, everything is amazing. But the way he covers that scene, I, I've seen uh, interviews with Tarantino where he say he'll have three days to shoot a scene like that, where when you're doing a television episode, you've normally got about four hours. <laughs> But if he has normally has three days to shoot uh, one of his average scenes, he probably had seven days for that because that, that is a masterclass way to shoot a scene. So if you're ever looking for the best way to shoot a scene, especially of two people sitting down and with very little movement around the room, that's the way to do it. Now, another thing I tend to do is when I'm watching a scene is if somebody picks up a telephone and they walk across a room and they're looking one direction in one part of the scene and the other direction in the other part, I will do a little drawing of the screen direction on my script and actually over the dialogue, I will draw the other side. So when I come to shoot in the other side of that uh, telephone conversation, I can mirror it because you never want the people looking in the same direction. That can be jarring to an audience. And talking about jarring, sometimes the screen direction is often often written before you find the location, or pretty much always written before you find a location. So another thing I try to do is engage with a writer uh, that I'm working with at that time. And if a character comes out of a scene and he's talking to his team, say he's like a FBI guy and he's going, you go south, you go north, you go... I try to make sure that everything is correct. So north is actually north, the south is actually south. That way the actor, again, knows that you've done your homework, uh, that it moves quicker, you know, there's the less conversation happening on set, especially if you're doing a daylight scene. Um, it just helps you get through your day a lot more quickly and a lot more efficiently. So quickly, meaning you can, it allows you to do more takes and get better performances and find better nuance within a scene. It's not all about just doing something fast. Now, David and I talked a little bit about this in, in episode uh, two about being on the dark side of the light. He, he calls it the side with most contrast. If you're looking at a scene and they get the key light from one side, you generally want to be on the other side. Um, the more you can learn about lighting, the better director you're going to be because you're going to go and sh you're going to show up on set and you're going to stand where you want the camera to be and it's going to be easier for your DP to light through the window or to light through the doorway or when you're outside to use the sun rather than blocking it out. And knowing all of this will save you hours out of the day and again get, allow you to put the, the money on the screen, it'll allow you to focus on the performances to get the very best out of your script and to elevate that thing from being good to great. Now there are, let's talk a little bit about, um, I've, I, when I was 27 I was doing this music video for Junior Jack in London and you only have one or two days when you shoot a music video. I remember shooting a scene where I had several police vehicles and a truck and they were driving through the rain and we had the key light and we set it all up and it was, you know, a big scene to shoot. We only had two hours left in our day, but I needed more than one angle in order to create enough tension, you know, to, to, to keep the, the rhythm of the story going. So rather than, I remember talking to the DP, I was like, how, how quick for the turnaround, meaning putting the camera on the other side and now seeing the vehicles come towards us. He said, well, it's gonna be about 20, 30 minutes to do. And I said, well, why don't we just turn the vehicles around and have them drive towards us? It's a wide shot anyway. You can't read that the number plates are back to front. Let's do that. So we turned them around, had them drive towards us. We, we flopped the shot afterwards. And sure enough, you have a, a shot of them driving away from us and driving towards us all shot within, you know, the same lighting setup and you can intercut the two and nobody ever knew the difference. Now, this came back years later. I was shooting a, a television show and we were on a subway car. Now, the entire episode took place in a subway car. So we talked with the UPM and the producer and everybody involved and we, we had a subway car and we didn't want to green screen it because it was going to, you know, cost us a ton of money to do that. So we found these LED screens, which are ridiculously expensive, like $70,000 or something. And we surrounded one third of the train in the front of the train and one third of the train only on one side. And we were like, well, that's all we can afford to do. So I was like, OK, so that's great when we're looking down the train. But when we have to turn around and shoot the reactions of the actors, 
we don't have any screens there. So how long is it going to take for the screens to move to the back of the train? Well, you know, two hours, three hours, you know, they, these giant LED screens. So what we deduced was we used that same method that I used in that Junior Jack um, music video when I was 27, and we mirrored the train. So the front of the train was exactly the same as the back of the train. And what we did was instead of taking the panels and moving them to the back of the, the train, we just took the actors and we 180'd them. So suddenly the actor that's at the back of the train looking down to the front of the train is actually at the front of the train looking back down to the back of the train. And then because we still had the screens behind them, I reversed the footage on the screen, which is like a tunnel running by, and suddenly it looked like we were looking out the back of the train. So little tricks like that can save you a lot of time, can help you get the very best out of what a scene needs. I was doing another show where we were shooting our lead actor. She was coming out of a vehicle and she had to, you know, run in the way it ended up playing out, she had to ended up running into a park and her face was front lit by the sun. Now, in the wide shot, that was fine. In the close up, the DP wanted to bring in this giant fly swatter. That's one of those big screens you'll see on a crane and it'll create a nice soft light over the actor. And again, that's like a 30 minute deal, right? You're in New York City, it's busy, you've got traffic, you've got to move the whole thing around. And I was like, well, we aren't just in a close up. Can't we just get a four by four of the same material and get a grip to hold it and shade her and the grip can move back with us while we're shooting the scene? And he was like, yeah, okay. So we did that and that's how we got through the scene in a fraction of the time that it would have been to bring that giant crane in and that uh, 40 by 40 foot fly swatter. Now let's talk about post a little bit. Uh, when it gets to the edit suite, uh, that situation, um, personally what I like to do is I'll have in my head, I would have cut it together in my head as we're shooting it. I try not to tell the editor too much of that information early on because I want to see what they can bring to the story. So they might put a scene together in a completely different way than I imagined it, maybe better, maybe worse, but either way they put it together the way that they see it first and then I'll come in and we'll talk about it, we'll talk about what's working, what I imagine, why this might be better, why it might be worse, and together we'll start painting this you know, little picture together. Now tonally, uh, emotionally, the editing is so, so important. So as much time as you can put in it, as much as possible. Sound design, I find, is a huge, huge, huge part of it. Personally, I cannot uh, watch action sequences without music um, or heavy sound design. I find it distracting. I, I, I don't understand the rhythm of a scene unless I see that. Maybe that's because I come from a music video background. And then once you've got to a place, maybe like three or four days later, you've cut that scene and you've got this amazing action scene. What you've got to do is try to distance and distance yourself from it. And often what I do is I'll take something like, uh, you know, a, a small mirror or something and I'll sit at the back of the edit suite and I'll look into that mirror and I'll watch that action take place on that monitor, the mirrored image of that. And what you find is, your eye will jump all over the place and it may not make sense to somebody that's not as well versed to the scene as you are. So then you've got to make adjustments that way. If you look at um, the Mad Max movie, you know, they knew that they were going to make a lot of, uh, the Tom Hardy one, they knew they were going to make a lot of edits in that. So they made sure that everything was framed in the center. So Tom Hardy would be in the center, Charlie Theron would be in the center of frame. So if they're cutting, you know, every 17 frames, every second and a half, every three seconds, the eye isn't going to be jolting too much. So you've got to watch out for that too. Then, once you get the edit signed off, you go through all the process, you have the showrunner, the writers, you have the producers, you have everybody you know involved, depending on what the project may be, it may be the band. You've got to go into you know the next stage, which is often color grading, visual effects. Again, the more you can learn about that, the better. 
Years ago, I started working with this um, incredible colorist. His name is Mark Ethan, and he works at the Moving Picture Company in Los Angeles. I've known him for years and years and years. And early on in both of our careers, we would sit down and we would color grade all night long. <laughs> and we would try this look and that look. And we'd try, what if it happens we do that? And then I would look at these music videos and I'd go, oh, the Sam Bay would use uh, a red there if he had green there. And you learn how the colors work together. And I remember Mark used to have all of these incredible books, you know, like the books that I now have of Craig Cruisden or Philip Lockett de Garcia or any of these artists. And you'll, you will learn what works best in post and that will also inform you how you actually film something too. And it's the same thing with sound. If you're, you're mixing the sound and you find that the dialogue doesn't work very well for one of the actors and you could have actually done another take just for sound but now you have to ADR the sound, you have to bring the actor in and spend more money and the performance isn't going to be the same, then you would have been better off doing that on the day than you learn that you're, you know, when to make those choices. All right, so, you know, there you go. That's that's the most part of the process. There are other moments uh, that I forgot where, you know, you can talk about giving an actor motivation that sometimes somebody will say, you know, can an actor not smile during this scene? Well, you can't really give an actor the, the direction, like, can you not smile in this scene? You've got to understand where their motivation is coming from and you've got to get them to you've got to understand that and how you can turn that around if it feels jarring so it might be can you focus your emotion not on what you're thinking but on the person opposite you was thinking because that person is the the you should be your focus within the scene right now there's little things like that that you know they, you're always going to find so you know i'm going to start wrapping it up now um you know my final thoughts are start as young as you can work as hard as you can work harder than anybody else enjoy it enjoy it enjoy it the journey is more important than anything else if i were to go back and do something differently i would go back and i would have written scripts on those moments where I, I might not get a music video or a commercial or I, I've always been writing since doing television dramas and I found that it not only has it made me a better director it's helped me it's helped new doors open. I sold a script to Sony and I was talking to Sony about it and then they got me to pitch on a pilot. I sold a script to a company in the UK. You know, so it makes you a better director by writing. It makes you respect the material a lot more. Whether those projects end up being made or not, it, create, it keeps you being creative when you're not being creative. So... My thing is I need to do something creative every day. So if I'm not filming, if I'm not on set, I might be writing, I might be doing a podcast, I might be doing something where I can express creativity in one area or another. Generally, that's writing. I'm dyslexic, so that was a big problem for me, especially in my early 20s. But if I'd known, if I'd listened to this podcast and I could have translated the just shoot shit, just make shit philosophy that Scott Mann uh, had, I would have just written a bad script after bad script after bad script until they got good. I ended up doing that anyway, but I didn't know that. I just discovered that from doing it and out of uh, you know the need to do this and out of the want to, to make uh, um, movies. Um, interpret the script. It, the script isn't you know this the script is the core of everything but you've also got to interpret it it's not if you direct just the script and you just do it exactly how it's not on the page and you don't bring anything to it then you're you know what are you doing there you you've got to you've got to add to it and that way you can make a good script great or a great script uh, incredible you have to be bold, you have to have a voice, you have to use your voice, you have to find out what that voice is and you have to go and use that to the best of your ability. Anyway, um, that concludes this show. Thank you so much everybody for listening. I hope that there's somebody out there that really draws from this and um, will 10 years down the line maybe tell me that it helped them get to where they needed to be. That's really why I did this. It was the one thing that I wished that I had when I was starting off as a filmmaker or even 10 years into being a filmmaker, I could have, and I still do now, 
draw a lot of uh, information and a lot of knowledge from this. So I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I, and thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'm not going to ask you to give it a five-star review or for you to subscribe. And there is no Patreon site. I created this show to help people who don't have mentors or role models. People who want to work in the film industry but don't know which path they should take. So if you know someone who might like or benefit from the show, all I'm asking is for you to share it with them. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be listening to their story. Remember 19 media.